All right, well, let's make a start, shall we? It's great to have you all here. Uh, I can't see everybody all at the same time, but I know there are lots of you. And uh, from what I have seen, I know we've got folks not just from Cambridge, but from all around this country and even overseas. Hello, Mercy from India. It's good to have you with us. We are uh, working through the, the Ten Commandments uh, as a church each Sunday morning. And this morning we're looking at the, the fourth commandment, the commandment about the Sabbath day. Now, you perhaps know already, but the, the Ten Commandments are stated in two places in the Bible. First in the book of Exodus, but then again they're restated by Moses right near the very end of his life in the book of Deuteronomy. And for this commandment in particular, they're, they're stated in slightly different ways. I want to read to you, we're, we're really following through the book of Exodus, but uh, just as we start our service, I want you to see how the commandment is, is put in the book of Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any other animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember, and here's the key as we begin, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Can you see that link? We're going to think particularly about the Sabbath day as a day of rest this week. We'll stick with the same theme next week, the fourth commandment, but we'll see it's a day of worship. But, but can you see why it is that it was a day when they should stop and worship the Lord their God? You were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The Exodus is always given in the Bible as a picture of the greater salvation that God gives us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are set free from being slaves to sin and death and judgment, free to worship the Lord our God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the purpose. That was the underlying thing that, that made a day of rest and worship possible. And that's with that thought we'll begin our service. So let me lead us in prayer as today we celebrate the salvation that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we long for that day when we can meet together physically as a church, when we can see one another and shake hands, share tea and coffee together, be with one another properly. But we recognize at this point, it's not possible. It wouldn't be wise and it wouldn't be an expression of love, neither for one another nor for the community around us. Instead, we are very grateful, our Father, that we can meet in the way that we are meeting through this uh, Zoom technology. We want to pray that you would bless us on this day and that you would bless our service be with us and fill us afresh with your spirit as we remember all that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. We were once alienated from you, but now in Christ we have drawn near. We were once your enemies, but now in Christ peace has been made. We thank you for the salvation that is ours in him. And we ask simply that our worship and celebration of that this morning would be pleasing in your sight. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing a song as we begin. Uh, the, the music will be in the background, the words on the screen. Keep your, keep your microphones off and let me encourage you to sing loudly at home. Uh, we, we start with a song that speaks of the song of creation, actually. Creation delights in the Lord God who made it. Let's sing together. Creation sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson waves. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, his breath upon the spinning globe, he chants the eagle's flight. And the newborn babies cry.
Sometimes doing these services, I feel like a radio DJ trying to predict when the song's going to end. Well, I don't do that very well. The times two was slightly ambitious, wasn't it? Times ten at the end of that verse might have been better. Uh, we are really pleased to welcome with us uh, a guest to our service this morning. Uh, Joe Schoons uh, has 
joined us. Uh, she's involved in the work of CAP and goes to our sister church in the north of Cambridge. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let's get Joe front and centre if we can. There we go, everyone can see you now, Joe. Joe, thanks very much for being with us. That's uh, fine. Tell us just a little bit about yourself. Let us know who you are and who that guy is sitting next to you. <laughs> this is my thing. lovely husband. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm Joe. I go to Grace Church. I am a, a mum of grown-up children who've ne long since left home. I'm now a grandma. That's the most exciting recent news. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but my grandson's in America at the moment, which is where my, my son and daughter in law live. Um, what else do you want to know? I've got a background in nursing. That's my kind of background. And I've been working for CAP now for about eight years. So. Okay. You'll, you're going to tell us a bit about CAP, and we want to pray for you in that ministry later on. But for now, just tell us a little bit about how you became a Christian. So I was brought up in a Christian home, and I was very you know, very aware, I think, all my life about God's existence. And I had parents who were great examples, I think, of what being a Christian was all about, in as much as our house was always open to every wake and stray you can imagine. We had people from all over the world living with us. We had family members who were in crisis or difficulty who would be living with us. So, you know, my, my entire sort of childhood and growing up was being surrounded by lots of different people from all different backgrounds um but when i was about 13 i think i realized that actually i had to make that decision for myself and i went to a crusader camp and i remember having a conversation which annoyed me at the time actually with this particular crusader leader who said to me do you go to church and i said yes she said that doesn't make you a christian <laughs> um do you believe in god and i said yes she said, that doesn't make you a christian so he went through this list of things that didn't make me a christian um but at the time i it also made me realize that actually i needed to make a decision so at that that stage of my life i decided to follow christ and that was you know just a continuation i think of what he what jesus has already been doing in my life anyway growing up um, and so, so that was the beginning of it. And it didn't mean that life suddenly dramatically changed for me. I don't think it did at that point, except that I was very aware that I needed to include him, I think, is perhaps, or talk to him about my life and where things were going. As you got older, did you find that you drifted away from your faith and from the church? Or did it, was your faith in Christ always something that stayed strong and in the forefront of your life? Um, I think in my, when I first left home, I was very keen to be a part of a church and I found that a very difficult time. Um, I found myself probably praying a lot more because I think I felt a lot more vulnerable. And so I was sort of flinging myself more on, on God, I think, at that particular time. But thankfully, um, I found a very small church. I don't remember anything much about it except that the people were unbelievably friendly and I had lots of invitations for meals at people's homes right. and that for me at that time actually really helped me because going into nursing um, was really tough actually I found that a really difficult thing you know you turn up it, I think it's changed a bit now but you turn up you'd go to school for four weeks and then you'd be on a ward in your uniform and everyone thought you were a nurse yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that was really really tough and being responsible for people at quite a young age in that way um, it's really demanding very demanding and so having having this church family was a, was, was brilliant um, I think for me it was much later in, in life where I perhaps began to question church in many ways and um, you know, began to think, what's the point of this? I'm going along here. I'm not really doing anything different. It's, um, so I think there was a stage probably later in my life where I began to, to question the point of going to church. What was, what was the point of this? Um, and how was that resolved? You're obviously with us this morning. Yeah, well, a husband who says, no, we're still going. Um, that was always, <laughs> that was a big a big thing is sort of keeping me going I think when I couldn't see the point of still going yeah. um, and then just through that I think God speaking to me through his word and the encouragement of um, 
of just he, who he is, I think, and kind of becoming, um, perhaps having a fresh understanding of, of what God had done for me in my life. And so I think that's probably how that was resolved. God just working by his spirit and helping me through that particular stage. That's wonderful. Joe, we'd love to we'd just have a, a short time of prayer. We've got the boys and girls with us. It's good, isn't it, to, to remember as we uh, hear from different people that we're not saved by being good people. Uh, salvation is not a reward for our good works. Instead, we're saved by trusting in Jesus and his death and resurrection for us. We're really glad to have Joe with us and glad that she can testify to that. There's a lovely verse in the Bible that talks about what it means to become a Christian. It says this, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Let me just say a short prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for this uh, wonderful and humbling truth. None of us are good enough to deserve to know you, to live with you, to call you our Heavenly Father and be given the hope of heaven. All of these things are a, a most amazing gift that you give us, not because we are good, but because you are good. You are gracious and merciful. We want to pray, Father, that you would go on forgiving us our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Spirit, who transforms us from the inside out, make us more into the likeness of your Son, we pray. We thank you that you have uh, done this great work in Joe, and even at times when um, uh, living for the Lord Jesus Christ and committing to God's people were a bit more tricky for her, nevertheless you held her and supported her through those days. And we thank you now that you are using her to serve in amazing ways in this city. We want to pray that we would be an encouragement to her this morning, just as she is an encouragement to us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, we are very fortunate this morning because it is not me uh, who will read uh, the kids' story for us. Boys and girls, we're going to dig into the Bible and have a Bible story quiz at the end, remember? So concentrate. Let's see if we can get it. But Alice Horton is going to take us through this one. So Alice, if you're there, well done, Alice. Away you go. Picking corn on the Sabbath. The Sabbath day was a day of rest. Jewish farmers who obeyed God's law would not harvest their crops on the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields. His disciples began picking some ears of corn, rubbing them in their hands and eating the grain. Now the Pharisees had made their own strict rules to say what people could or couldn't do on the Sabbath. When they saw the disciples picking a few ears of grain, they accused them of harvesting on the Sabbath. Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They demanded. Do you not read the scriptures? Jesus replied. Have you, have you ever read what King David did when he, was, he and his men were hungry? He went into the temple and took the showbread. The special bread was placed before the Lord and ate it. Illegal as it was, he shared it with others. Then the, Jesus declared, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Alice, thank you. That's really good of you to have read that for us. Thank you very much. All right, uh, boys and girls, time for a quiz. I need to get my chat box up on the screen. Now, uh, you can uh, type your answers or you can get your mum and dad to type for you. Uh, same as usual, it'll be answer one, two, or three. But let's go for the first question. Question one, how well were you listening? Uh, in a, uh, where were Jesus and the disciples walking when this all happened? In a cornfield? In a Starbucks? I haven't even asked the question. <laughs> and you're answering already! In a cornfield, in a Starbucks, in a forest. And oh, I'm just getting a field of, of ones. The Hortons say one, the Rao say one. I'm, I'm hoping the Hortons got it right because Alice read it to us. Dan and Katie, well done. That must be Josiah and, uh, and Lydia who have got that one right. And Joel P, my own son, <laughs> camping in a field in Coveney. 
gets it right as well. It was indeed not in a Starbucks, but in a cornfield. All right, here's question two. Who was upset with the disciples? Was it the farmer? They shouldn't have been touching the crops. Was it Jesus? They shouldn't have been picking the grain. Or was it the Pharisees? Who was upset? A quick three from the Hortons. Very good. Oh, Harry and Jessica is a three. Asa and Seth and Honor. I wonder which of the three of you got that one right, but three is right. Well done, Josiah. The Rowles and Joel P again gets it right. Well done. Okay, here's question three. In the Old Testament, which king gave his men bread to eat from the temple? Was it our very own King Asa Day? Was it King David or was it King Saul? The Hortons give us a two. Daniel, Edward, Jacob, Seth, give us a two. Harry and Jessica, give us a two. I hope, Asa, that's you giving us a two from the Day family. Joel, P, you're all right. Once again, it is a number two. You can stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, we're going to sing a song. Um, I should mention, by the way, for the grown-ups and for the young people who will stay for the sermon, we'll, we'll look at that incident. As, as we try and work out what this commandment to keep the Sabbath means. That's a key passage in the New Testament that's sometimes misunderstood. The other thing we'll talk about as we think about the Sabbath day is creation and the pattern of creation. And there's a great song for children that reminds us of the pattern of creation that we see in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We're going to have that song now. Sing along at home, keep your microphones off, but sing loud and proud. Here we go. He made a part Day two Still more to do I and C were made to be And it was good Just as it should Well, uh, Jo's with us, uh, not only so we can get to know her, but particularly because of her work with Christians Against Poverty. There's a shot of their website. Uh, we'd love to know more about uh, Christians in, Against Poverty in general, Jo, but particularly your ministry and uh, what we can pray for you. Yeah, okay. Well, I've written, written something down. Is that okay? Should I just read that out? Do, uh, go for it, yeah. Okay, so basically um, Grace Church have worked now with CAP for about eight years. And CAP, as you know, is a charity, Christians Against Poverty, and CAP partners with local churches to provide a service offering hope and opportunity for people to rebuild their lives. 
and we help and equip families and individuals struggling with debt or unemployment as well as enabling folk to break free from destructive habits and learning new life skills. And so through this work, um, we've all learned a lot, but also it's been great um, because we can demonstrate the gospel practically and also tell of the good news of Jesus Christ while we're doing that. And as a result of the work we've been doing at Grace Church, many of our CAP friends are now debt free. Um, and also many of them have got jobs. I think we've got over 50% of the folk that we've seen who've now got jobs. Um, but also many have learned how to manage in difficult relationships. But the important thing I think is that several of our CAP friends have had their lives transformed by coming into a relationship with Christ for themselves. And it's been really wonderful to see that as the years have gone by, these new Christians have really grown in their love of the Lord and telling others about him. And I just want to tell you a very great example of that happening. So there's a lovely lady, and let's call her Dot, um, and her friend Jean. So Jean worked with us about five years ago. She was not interested in Christianity at all but she was very pleased with the help that she'd received and so she told her friend Dot um, and Dot who was in a lot of debt she had an incredibly messy life relationship issues all sorts of problems very chaotic um, Dot made contact with us and I'm pleased to say that she went debt free but the most exciting thing about Dot was that she became a Christian and she began to repair relationships to get her life back in order and she also began to talk to her friends and Jean, being one of those friends, could then see how much Dot had changed since she had met with Christ. And the, the very exciting thing about that now is that Dot and Jean and myself, we meet once a week and we look at John's Gospel together. So it'd be great if you could pray for that, pray for Jean, that she would give her life to Christ. So the way that CAP works is that, um, that we actually come al alongside folk in their own homes normally. At the moment, it's a little bit different. We hold hands, so to speak, with people um, as they walk through whatever challenges life is throwing at them. And sometimes that can be re really tough. Sometimes the work is, is hard going, but the re rewards really outstrip that. And there's, there's nothing more exciting, I think, more... Um, wonderful than seeing somebody like Dot standing up in front of a whole congregation and telling them about how amazing Jesus is. So that's just a little story of one of the many that I could tell you. Um, but yeah, if you could just continue to pray for our new Christian folk, for the work that we're doing, and particularly with the fact that things are much um, more challenging at the moment because we're having to do things so much more remotely, that would be fantastic. We certainly can pray for that, Jay. And uh, we should perhaps say it, it's been great. Uh, not everyone in the church has had a chance to get to know you, but a, a few of us have. And um, we've partnered to, to help a couple of families uh, that are a bit nearer to Rock than they are Grace Church. Uh, that's a partnership that we've been thinking about as a church, whether we want to strengthen that and formalize that. Uh, that's a decision to be made in due course. But certainly for now, we want to be praying for Joe and... Uh, praying for that ministry. It's such a brilliant and vital ministry, not only to help folks in really desperate need, but also uh, to share the message of the Lord Jesus with them. Uh, uh, Phil, I think I'm right in saying yes. Phil Griffin, if you're there. Yeah, we're here. Great. Hey, I hear congratulations are in order, Phil. Thank you. Yes, we had our um, 11th grandchild born on Friday. Um, Theo Joel, you'll like the middle name. Uh, a great name, great name. You're going to lead us in prayer, Phil. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, let's all pray together, shall we? Our loving Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the encouragement we've had this morning to hear from Jo. We thank you for how um, you brought her to yourself through the work of Crusaders and how you've kept her and encouraged her and led her into the work that she's doing with CAP. We um, come to you at a time when many are finding their jobs under threat and um, the money situation really difficult and increasing debt and in a time in the world where these stresses are so much greater Lord we do thank you that there are um, people like Joe and organizations like CAP who will step into the breach and will help and 
support and encourage those who are finding things so very difficult. Lord, we praise and thank you for that. Lord, your word uh, tells us that you um, love and care for the poor. Our Lord Jesus set us an example in bringing the gospel to the poor and spending his time with those who are in great need. And Lord, we want to follow his example and we thank you for the opportunities that CAP provides. Lord, we thank you for how you led John Kirkby to bring the organisation into existence and how it's developed and grown across um, this country and, and in other countries too. Lord, we um, just ask that you will be with Joe and those at Grace who are um, serving you through this role at the moment. We thank you for them and we ask that you will be with them, encourage them and that we pray that they will see your hand at work um, in all their efforts to help and support those in great need. We do thank you so much for the story of Dot and Jean. We thank you for how Dot came to know you through um, the work uh, that Joe has done. And we praise you for that. We thank you for her um, improvement in the debt situation, but especially that she's found the Lord Jesus Christ to be her saviour. And for her witness uh, to Jean, we thank you for that and for how this uh, little group has got together to study your word through the Gospel of John. And we pray, Father, that your spirit will be at work in Jean's heart and that she will come to know you and to love you and to serve you and to share the good news of the gospel with others as well. Father we do ask that you will lead uh, us as a church as we seek to serve you um, and look at this ministry. We pray Father for wisdom and for uh, your guidance as to how uh, that should work at Rock and we just pray Lord that you'll be with us through that. Thank you Father for all that CAP has done and we just pray that you will continue to bless, encourage, uplift them and that their work will see many not only be debt free, but come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And we thank you in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, let me just say before we move on from uh, CAP that we, we've already had a, a few folks within the church who've expressed an interest in uh, volunteering alongside Joe in the work of CAP in our local area, there is a huge need, you can perhaps imagine, uh, and it's only going to go up as the um, effect, the economic effects of the lockdown hit our communities. Debt's going to be a, a real problem. And so uh, I've had a few folks come forward, say that they'd like to talk to Joe and, and become better equipped to volunteer with CAP. If you'd like to be added to that number, please let me know and we'll arrange a, a meeting perhaps in Zoom, perhaps over a garden if we're really fortunate and uh, we can work out how we can get more involved. Well, we come now to uh, the reading of God's word in preparation for a sermon. Uh, younger children, you guys will have received or your parents will have got the Sunday school material. Uh, perhaps your mum and dad, this is the point that they want to take you out and you're going to do your Sunday school. It may be that you're going to sit and listen in. That's great if you are and you could do your Sunday school later. For our uh, young people, there is a, a guidance sheet, a kind of sheet that takes them through the sermon. Uh, again, that went to your parents. Uh, now's the time to print that out if you hadn't already, and it will help you follow the sermon. And Cecile is going to read to us from God's Word. If you've got a Bible there, why not dig it out? We're in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and we're looking at the fourth commandment. Uh, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Thank you, Anne Cecile. Let's pray as we come to God's word, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, and particularly as we approach these Ten Commandments, give us wisdom to understand the true meaning and intent of the commandments, and give us a heart and a will that is... Um, filled with a desire to be obedient, not out of a, a slavish sense of duty, but rather out of a heart filled with a love for you 
that we would, as the psalmists say, delight in your law and love to live this way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, look, let's just uh, start as the, the, the commandment there, as it's given us in the book of Exodus, finishes, because it's such a key uh, starting place, I think. It, it, the commandment finishes with these words, Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, that is, and I want you to see this from the outset, the Sabbath day is presented not just as a separate, a special day, a, a holy day, that means a day set apart in a special way for God, but it's also a wonderful blessing given by God to his people. That is, uh, a talk of the Sabbath should make us smile and rejoice, not frown and despair. And yet for so many of us, our, our reactions aren't quite what they ought to be. We're a congregation where actually not many of us have grown up and stayed within the congregation. As a congregation, we have a, a variety of different church backgrounds. We were brought up in a variety of different families. And therefore, we, we come to something like this fourth commandment, the Sabbath day, and, and we bring with us a variety of, of different understandings, particularly on how uh, this, if at all, impacts us in the New Testament age today. Uh, put simply, this is the commandment over which there is probably the most confusion. Uh, and for that reason, we're going to slow down on the fourth commandment. I'm going to uh, take a little bit longer this morning than I would on other weeks. And we'll talk about the fourth commandment again next week. Uh, just to be clear, uh, we'll cover it over two weeks, not because it's more important than the other nine commandments, but because we have such a, a wide variety of experiences and because there's so much uh, misunderstanding in the wider church, for clarity, we're going to go a bit more slowly. This morning, we're, we're going to focus on the idea of rest. Next week, we'll, we'll think about how this Old Testament picture of rest impacts for us today. So listen, as a little warning, let me say, bear with me. You're likely to feel a little bit frustrated by the end of this morning, you're likely to be left with the question, well, so what? What difference does that make? And let me say that's a good question, and I'll try and make sure you have an answer to that by the end of next week's service. But we want to go uh, to the commandment itself, and let's explore it together. Remember the Sabbath day. Here's how it's presented in the book of Exodus, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. This is where we begin then. Uh, Moses establishes this pattern for the week of the Israelites. Six days of work followed by one day of not working. In fact, the word Sabbath itself in Hebrew means to cease or to stop. And God through Moses says it applies not just to the Israelites themselves, but as you'll have heard, as Anne Cecile read it to us, to their servants and the animals, everything and everyone within the, the nation of Israel. And as an explanation as to why they should follow this working pattern or this pattern of the week, here's what, here's what Moses writes. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. So our starting place in this journey to understand the fourth commandment is perhaps surprisingly, not within the Ten Commandments themselves, not in the book of Exodus, but, but even as the commandments are given, we are whizzed back to the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. God could have created all things in just a single instant. Jesus turned water into wine in a moment. Jesus calmed a storm in just a second. But back in creation, we see God choosing to take his time, choosing to adopt a particular pattern to his work. It, it, he describes it as a seven-day pattern in which God, excuse me, creates all things in six days. And then on the seventh day, well, here's how the Lord himself puts it in Genesis chapter 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. That is that God chooses to describe this to us in this way. He sets apart day seven as a day when he ceases his work of creating anything new. 
and simply delights in his perfect work of creation completed in the first six days. We're told at the end of day six that God looks at all that he has made and says it is very good. Now look, that's an assessment we can trust. Uh, people may be disputing the results of A-levels and GCSEs in particular this year, but God's assessment at the end of Genesis 1 is not in doubt. God delights in the perfection of his creation on day seven. Uh, and this delight, this pausing from creating anything new, simply sustaining what already exists, God calls rest. Then God blessed the seventh day, Genesis 2 verse 3, and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Genesis 2 then is our starting point, and it contains three words that we'll find right the way through the Bible as we consider this idea of the Sabbath. They are the words uh, blessed and holy and rest. If you are eagle-eyed, you may have noticed that the word Sabbath isn't actually used in Genesis chapter 2, but hidden from us uh, English speakers who can't read the Hebrew text, actually the, the, the root word in Hebrew is right there in verse 2, when God is described as resting, he is Sabbathing. And so we might call this pattern of work and rest a creation ordinance, that is, God built this pattern into the very fabric of creation. Now look, no mention again is made of this pattern of six days of work and one day of Sabbath until we get to the book of Exodus, which causes uh, scholars to ask lots of questions about what happened in the rest of the book of Genesis. Perhaps the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, continued this pattern from the creation as they understood it. Or, or perhaps in the fall, as sin corrupted the whole world, sin uh, a, a clouded this commandment and they lost sight of this pattern and so didn't follow it. The, the reality is we, we can't know for certain through the book of Genesis. But certainly as we get to the book of Exodus, we see this pattern of work and rest established for God's people after they've been rescued from, from slavery in Egypt. After they've been rescued, but importantly, before they're given the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 16, God tells uh, the people through Moses that he will sustain them in their desert wanderings as he gives them manna from heavens. And he tells them that on the Friday, the sixth day, they're to collect double the normal amount. And this is the reason he gives. This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow, that would have been their Saturday, is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Now, note again that that was before the Ten Commandments. That is to say, the Sabbath pattern wasn't revealed for the first time at Mount Sinai. It seems to be in a creation pattern which was understood and recognized as a pattern for God's people to follow even before the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments then just put into law what was already being practiced by God's people. Okay. But what should happen on this special day, this last day of the week? And for, for ease and for simplicity, I, I want to focus on two aspects of the Sabbath day as we see it in the Old Testament. A day of rest, first of all, and then secondly, a day of worship. We'll cover a day of worship next week, and we'll look at the implications in the New Testament for us today next week as well. So today we'll focus on a day of rest, as it's described in the Old Testament, and then as Jesus deals with it. Day of rest. God ceased his work on the seventh day, and he calls on his people, Israel, to, to follow his pattern, that there to stop their normal work as well on the seventh day too. But look, as we, as we explore this fourth commandment, there's something really important, something that I have to say is sometimes overlooked, and that is that as the Ten Commandments are explained and applied through the rest of the Old Testament, we see that there's kind of nuance here. Specifically, God gives exceptions to this Sabbath rest. Uh, here's a, a few quick examples. Um, uh, uh, the priests are told that they can work on the Sabbath in the sanctuary, Leviticus 24. Uh, soldiers are told that they can keep guard on the Sabbath if a, a city is vulnerable and under attack. A and in Exodus 12, we see that food is prepared to eat on the Sabbath, something that we might consider work and yet is permitted on the Sabbath. How should we 
think about those exceptions. Well, look, you know perhaps because we've spoken of it before in this series that the Old Testament works on the basis of case law, specific examples being worked out to help us see the core principle that stands at the heart of the law. And so if these exceptions are understood to be illustrative of a, of a proper understanding of the fourth commandment, not to work on the Sabbath, then we can perhaps put it something like this, that the Israelites were not to work on the Sabbath unless there were God-given exceptions, unless that work was a work of necessity, perhaps like the priests in the temple, or a work of mercy, like food preparation for a hungry family. I want you to see then that the, the Sabbath law was always to be applied with care and wisdom in the Old Testament. It wasn't a, a blunt tool to bash someone over the head with. If a midwife, for example, helped a, a, a young woman give birth to a child on the Sabbath, the Israelites weren't supposed to grab the midwife and stone her to death for, for breaking the Sabbath commandment. That was never the intent of the law. There were always exceptions given in the Old Testament. These exceptions, it's important to say, doesn't, don't nullify the fourth commandment. There's another good example of that. A farmer, for example, may have wanted to argue that, that harvesting crops during harvest time wasn't a luxury, it was an essential, it was necessary, and an act of mercy because it meant people were fed. But actually, very specifically, God commands that that mustn't be done. That's normal work and shouldn't be done on, on, on the seventh day, God says in the book of Exodus. Normal work with time pressure doesn't count as an exception. To cease from normal work, to rest, can you see, particularly for a, a farming community, the community of Israel that first received these commandments, was a, was a huge deal. Because particularly within a farming community, there's a very direct link, isn't there, between income and the amount of hours that you work. To stop working is to produce no money. And therefore, to obey the fourth commandment was always an act of faith, trusting that God would provide, and obedience to his word. Rest wasn't easy, but it was necessary. God didn't make humanity that we would work all day, every day. He commanded his people to take a Sabbath day rest. Which brings us to the story that Alice read to us earlier and how Jesus interacted with this idea of the Sabbath day as a day of rest. In our kids story, do you remember how Jesus' disciples picked the corn from the field? Now it's interesting, the Pharisees, as that account is related to us in Mark and in Luke, they, they don't charge the group with theft, under Old Testament law, you could pick the grain with your hands from another family's field. You just mustn't use a tool. That they instead charge Jesus with breaking the Sabbath because the corn was picked on a Saturday. Now, we know already that God made exceptions to the no work rule in the Old Testament. Works of necessity and mercy were permitted. And this incident would appear to be a work that could said to be either or even both. The disciples aren't working as farmers, uh, preparing crops for sale at the market. They're simply preparing and eating food on the Sabbath, which was permitted. So Jesus doesn't break the Sabbath commandment. The, the Pharisees' charge is false. And that's actually really important because, of course, and you know this already, but let me re-emphasize it to be clear. If Jesus was a lawbreaker, if Jesus didn't obey all of the law, including the Ten Commandments, then, it, then he couldn't be the perfect sacrifice offered by God on the cross. He, he could only, if he'd broken the law, he could only have been punished for his own sin, not ours. No, Jesus kept the law of God perfectly. But in Mark's gospel, as this incident is relayed to us, Jesus goes on to get to the heart of the commandment. And the Pharisees needed this clarification from Jesus because they would lost all sight of the real meaning of the Sabbath. Back in that day, the, the Pharisees had created all kinds of weird and wonderful new laws about the Sabbath. Uh, there was a limit on how far you could travel on the Sabbath day. Nothing in the Bible about that. They just made it up for themselves. Uh, they argued, the Pharisees, that you could ride a donkey on the Sabbath, but you couldn't put a saddle on the donkey on the Sabbath. You had to do that the day before. You could brush dirt off a coat, but you couldn't rub the coat. 
And if you were going to uh, uh, dip a, a radish in some salt, it could only be momentary because if you held it there too long, the radish may begin to pickle and that would be seen as a work. Can you see, in Jesus' day, as the Pharisees added man-made laws to God's law, that the real commandment became hidden behind this facade of made-up rules. And so Jesus, as Alice read to us, sets them straight. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. That's an important verse for us as we uh, begin this journey of working out what the, the fourth commandment means for us today. First of all, Jesus restates, that the, the, uh, 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 reiterates what we've seen already, that the Sabbath is created by God. It was made. Uh, secondly, he wants them to see that the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath, which is perhaps a, a bit tricky to understand. So let me uh, uh, illustrate by talking about road traffic laws and traffic cones I wonder if you were down Pern Road a week ago when the great sinkhole emerged and traffic cones were placed up. I imagine for a moment a line of traffic cones in the road. They, they cordon off a lane. And, and the deal is you, you don't cross the traffic cones. But one day you're driving down and you're, you're keeping in your area as you should. You're not crossing the cones. But all of a sudden a child runs out into the road. And at that moment, of course, you don't want to hit the child, so you do veer across the line of cones into the lane you shouldn't be in. And we would all say that is right and good to do, because the cones exist to provide safety on the roads, and so as a general rule, yeah, we, we don't cross a line of traffic cones. But of course, of course we cross the line if the safety of a child is at stake. That is, we might say the cones were made for people, not people for cones. It's the same idea at play here in this incident in the field for Jesus and in other similar incidents. In Luke's Gospel, for example, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus uh, heals a, a, a crippled woman on the Sabbath. And again, the, the Pharisees criticize him for, for working on the Sabbath. And he points out their hypocrisy. They themselves lead their donkeys out to get water on the Sabbath. The point isn't no work ever at all. Works of necessity and of mercy were permissible even in the Old Testament because the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So where are we? <clears throat> there we go. Here we go. Where are we? This special day the last day of the week, the Sabbath, was created by God for humanity. It was a day when normal work should stop, a day of rest. Yes, there were exceptions made for what we might call works of necessity and works of mercy. And Jesus, it would seem, rather than throwing out the Sabbath commandment, as some have suggested, rather upholds its true meaning and keeps it perfectly. But that's only the first aspect of this Sabbath day, a day of rest that we find in the Old Testament. The other big aspect that we find is that it's a day of worship. Worship because rest points towards God and his salvation and the coming new heavens and the new earth, which are described as a perfect eternal rest. But that's for next week. We'll clarify that next week and we'll see how that impacts for us uh, today when we explore that a bit more. Enough for now. We are though going to sing about that eternal rest to come. Uh, there is a day when Jesus will return and gather us home. Let's sing together. There is a day that all creation's waiting for. A day
Uh, why don't we bow our heads in prayer? Let's pray. Our Father, as we explore your Ten Commandments, in particular, as we try rightly to understand this call to a Sabbath rest, help us even now to resolve to be people who rest from our work. We know that you haven't made us to work all day, every day, but it is right to stop normal work and to focus on you. Uh, just for the Israelites back then, so too for us today, that's not always straightforward or easy. But we pray that, that by your grace we might be determined to do so, for we want to live according to the pattern you established right back in creation. We ask all these things for our good and for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, let me uh, run through a few notices if you're a guest. Uh, some of these will be for you. Others, you might have to just bear with us. Uh, the first to say is we've come to that great Sunday when we will have Richard Renouf back with us and uh, Bonkers Balloons will return. That's this afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, it's not too late to join in. If you've not requested balloons, please just let me or Dawn know. And uh, even this afternoon, I can hair around on my moped and push some balloons through your letterbox. Uh, we'd love as many people as possible to join and of course that applies to friends and guests as well if you've got a next door neighbor with children who might want to join in why not go and ask them after lunch and we can get balloons to them to join in that's this afternoon so come back at four for that uh, kids daily devotions through the period of the lockdown we've been producing uh, a video each day uh, monday to thursday and then meeting live on a friday with some of the younger children uh, this is just to say that next week will be the, the last week of that. After that, schools are going back. And uh, so we'll, we'll pause at that point and reassess. It may be that we bring, uh, we call it KDD, maybe that we bring KDD back for the holidays, but we'll, we'll see and talk to parents about what works best. But for now, next week's going to be the last week, just so you know. Uh, good news from James and Kay, all very uh, quick and unexpected, but they arrived back in London tomorrow, we've heard they're leaving um, uh, East Asia uh, uh, very soon in the middle of the night tonight. Uh, there's no panic, there's no emergency, it's just the tickets they were able to get. They travel via Brussels, I think, and will be back with us uh, tomorrow morning. Well, it's become a, a kind of habit, but quite a nice one, that at the end of our service, we all turn our microphones on, and in a slightly chaotic way, we say this lovely prayer of blessing for one another as we conclude our service. So uh, why not turn your microphone on and we say together the words of the grace. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.